Good afternoon. This is pretty good. Good afternoon. All right, all right, there we go. Um, I have good news and bad news. I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is if you just arrived at the summit, you have missed incredible speakers, conversations about what's happening across our nation today. If you didn't just arrive, the bad news is you've had lunch, probably a snack, it's three in the afternoon, and you're feeling it. The really good news is um, I get to introduce our next speaker. And I can say personally, professionally, Dr. Christensen is one of the best world-renowned thinkers today. I suppose his groundbreaking book, The Innovator's Dilemma, is the standard starting point. He wrote about the lumbering Goliaths of the business world, successful, set in their ways, and seemingly invincible. But despite their size and armor, they became easy prey for the Davids and their shepherd slings. How quickly fortunes change when confronted with the disruptive force of new approaches and new technology. Professor Christensen pointed out that the time to adapt is before the stone is even in the air. At that point, it is too late. In the modern economy, disruption is the new normal. Ante anticipation and innovation is how you survive. When Professor Christensen laid all this out in 1997, Amazon was an embryo and the founders of Netflix were sending out a test DVD to see if that would survive the post office. Obviously, he was a man ahead of his time. Those who listened included Steve Jobs, Michael Bloomberg, and Bill Gates. Paul Steinberg, the chief technology officer of Motorola Solutions, said this about Professor Christensen. He scared the crap out of me. The Economist named The Innovator's Dilemma one of the six most important books ever written about business. Professor Christensen followed that up with several other groundbreaking bestsellers, becoming the nation's foremost authority of disruptive innovation. In Disrupting Class, How Disruptive Innovation Will Change the Way the World Learns, he makes the compelling case for using technology to create a customized, student-centered education system. Forbes called Professor Christensen one of the most influential business theorists of the late 50 years, last, excuse me, last 50 years. Twice, he was ranked number one in the Thinkers 50, considered the world's most prestigious ranking of management thinkers. I could go on and on, as you can tell. But let me conclude with words from his daughter, Anne, who in an interview with Forbes gives us insight into the passion he has for teaching and the joy he takes in knowledge. She said, my dad is a perpetual student. He'd come home from work every day, excited about some comment a student had made or a paper they had written. He'd say, you'll never believe what I learned today. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Professor Clay Christensen. Gosh, it's just overwhelming to see people with so much substance amongst you to s spend your time listening to me. But I really hope that a few of the ideas that I offer might be helpful in the world that, that you're taking on. What I want to do is uh, talk to you about what I've learned over the last 40 years of a student about how to make organizations change. Uh, I decided that it didn't make any sense for me to tell you what I think you ought to know about changing our schools. But I did think that when you find a pro program or evidence that you ought to change, how do you make it happen? And I, I'm afraid that in order to do this, you're going to sit in the, the audience and wonder why 
he went that way instead of this way, and then why did he? But I hope that it'll, in the end, uh, fall into place. So uh, a number of years ago, I was just at work minding my own business. And I got a call from Secret Secretary of Defense uh, William Cohen, who was the Secretary of Defense when Clinton was our president. And I'd never met him before, but out of the blue, he said, Clay, I wonder if you would come to the Pentagon because we want to study what you've written in the first of my books, The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, to see what it means for us. And geez, for me, to have an opportunity to go to the Pentagon was a life-changing event. So I said, of course I'll come. And he said, uh, we figured out a date, and he said that um, he wants to present my research to his entire staff. And when he said his staff, uh, what I had in mind was I had been in his office before as a White House fellow, and I imagined that he'd have his staff of uh, seven, seven or eight uh, lieutenants and, and majors. Um, but he met me at the front door and ushered me into his uh, conference room, and there were about 50 people there. And he took me to the to the front and introduce me to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and then to the other chiefs, and then behind them were the secretaries of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Commandant of the Marine Corps. Behind them, all of the under and deputy secretaries, and behind them, all of the assistants of everything else. And he, I, I started to get scared, and I, <laughs> I said, what do you want me to say? And he said, oh, just seriously, he said, just present your stuff. And I had no idea what would in, in, in I had a stroke a number of years ago, and uh, a clot came from here and lodged itself above my mind, above my head. And it uh, f killed the place where I formulate speech. And so uh, one of you'll notice as I give my talk, I can't come up with the right words sometimes, and I apologize for that. Um, but he, Secretary Cohen just said, present your material, and then he sat down. And I described for the people there this theory of mine uh, called disruption. Uh, and I'll, I'll describe it in terms of a steel, an industry, of us making steel. Let's see if I come back here. As an illustration of disruption. And what I described was in the steel industry at the bottom of the market are simple products that we call concrete reinforcing bar or rebar. Uh, you and I could make rebar this afternoon in this if we wanted to. And then as you move up market, there are more sophisticated, higher performing products like iron and uh, rod and reel. Above those are uh, structural steel products like H beams and I beams. And the final is sheet steel that we use to make appliances and cars. And then I described in that industry how the ability to make steel improved over time. And there were innovative companies that were making good products better as they went higher and higher in the market. And I said that this, is, this describes the organization of almost every company. The products begin at the middle and then they go up, as you'll see why in a minute. And in the history of steel, there was something that made it even a little bit com complicated and that was in the 1960s, a new way of making steel emerged. And it came down at the bottom of the market going after rebar. And the reason why they came down at the bottom 
is they had figured out a different way to make steel that reduces the cost of steel by about 20%. And the way they did it was they found uh, scrap, put it in a big uh, container, um, and hit it with electricity, and a big explosion occurs, and all of this scrap steel becomes liquid, from which they then can make products. The reason why the mini, and the mini mills came in at the bottom of the market, however, is that the quality that they could produce was really crummy. Um, and uh, nobody would buy what the mini mills made except the rebar people at the bottom of the market because there are almost no specs for rebar to begin with. And then once you buried it in cement, you couldn't verify whether the, they had met spec or not. And so rebar was a perfect product for crummy products. And as they uh, attacked the bottom of the market, interesting, the reaction of the big integrated steel companies um, was to get out of that business. And the reason why is it wasn't good enough for what their customers needed. And the economics were crummy. So their gross margins, the mini mills at the bottom of the market, offered just 7%. And the integrated steel companies looked at, should we protect the bottom of the market? Or maybe we ought to move up to make higher pro uh, profit products, making angle iron and structural steel and so on. So as the mini mills expanded their ability to make rebar, the integrated mills got out of the business, or they focused on higher margin products. Because the margins in structural iron and rod and, and bar offered 12% margins. So they moved aggressively up there. And as the integrated mills looked down at the mini mills coming up, they thought, you know, we could make 12% in those products but if we could just make even better steel in structural steel, up there the gross margins are, 80, uh, are 18%. And so as they got out of the iron, I, angle iron and bar and rod markets, for the integrated steel companies, their profits improved by getting out. And as the mini mills came in, their profits improved by getting in. And it really fit with each other. But what happened to, to the prices of raybar and angle iron and steel is as they got out, moved up market, and the integrated mills reacted by getting out, um, both of their profits improved over time. Integrated mills by getting out and the mini mills by getting in. And as soon as they had driven the last high-cost integrated player out, the prices of steel dropped by 20%. And so the, the, the cost of um, rebar dropped by 20% in 1979 when the integrated mills got out. And then the, steel, the cost of angle iron and bar and rod again dropped by 20% when the integrated mills got out. And as, the, uh, as they dropped out, the prices dropped out, the integrated mills moved up and the integrated mills moved in. And so in 1979, they integrated in, into structural steel. The price dropped by uh, 20%. And uh, the integrated mills then moved up into structural steel. And the integrated steel companies had to go up as soon as they could in order to make money. And so that's the story. I, I haven't done it justice here. But one of the things that we, I would just say, there are, um, in this story, there's no bad management involved. Um, the integrated steel companies now have de de declined to account for only 20 or 30 percent of the total amount of steel made in America. 
and the integrated or the new new cores of the world now produce about 70 to 80 percent of all of the steel. And nobody intended to have this happen. It just happened in the pursuit of profit. And so I described how this had worked in the industry, uh, at the steel industry. And Secretary uh, General Shelton, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, called, put his hand up. And he said, Clay, um, you're clueless about why we're interested in your study. And I said, I am clueless. Can you help me? And he, he said, leave this chart on the board. And, uh, and he, he then had a marker. And he went up to the top of the market where we say a sheet steel. And he said, we don't call that sheet steel. We call that the Russians. And they have been the high end of our market. They have been very complicated, per, uh, capable uh, opponents. And uh, he said, what you call the integrated steel mills, we call that the US Department of Defense. And we tried to do everything for everybody. And then at the bottom of the market, he crossed out rebar. And he said, for us, that's, those are the Russian, the, those are the, ter the terrorism, the terrorists. And they're just doing the simplest of the things, but they're going up. And what you call mini mills, we call that non-nation nations like Al-Qaeda. And there isn't anything, he said, about the way we make, uh, the, the way these guys make uh, steel and the way we're organized give us any hope at all that we can succeed in uh, uh, fighting terrorism and, and, and the non-nation nations. Anyway, uh, when we finished the, study, the, the discussion and it was time for questions, a lot of questions went up in the air. And many of the questions were focused on, do you have any examples of somebody, an integrated steel company that was the core leader in the industry who got caught by coming at the bottom of the market by the mini mills? Is there any example of some that survived? And it turned out that there were a few, but in every case, they had, they had been successful by setting up a completely different business organization and get, giving them a charter at the bottom of the market to do simple products and then move up. And I described there have been a few examples of people who have done that, like IBM did it. But uh, there are only a few, and, and everybody who survived had to d do this. And then they had all kinds of questions about why this was and so on. Anyway, for after about two hours, uh, we, there was no time. But we agreed that we would stay in touch. About uh, two months later, Secretary Cohen called me up again. And he said, you need to know that today we're announcing a fourth unit in the Department of Defense. We have the Army, Navy, Air Force, and the new one we call Special Forces Command to go, up, to go after terrorism. And uh, I complimented him on what I thought was a very insightful d d decision. And he said, you know, we have, been pro we have been wrestling with this problem for how to organize to, to go after terrorism. We've been working on this for six years, and we have never been able to make progress because we sit around and we talk past each other and we don't agree on anything. And he said, what this taught us is that there is no data about the future. And we have been arguing about no data. And then he said, 
What you brought was a common language and a common way to frame the problem. And by providing the language and the way to frame the problem and an understanding with this being a theory of what happened, uh, we were able to make substantial progress in a very short amount of time because of what you brought. And I just thought that was brilliant on his part. The insights that there is no data about the future. And so why do we ever think that we'll be able to reach consensus when there's no data that we need? And if we can only make sense on data and until it's available, we will ever, never make, a, we will never be able to take action. And the idea that you resolve problems by having a common language also has been very helpful. So that whenever somebody wants me to explain whether I think it's going to be this way or that, my policy has been to say, you know, I actually don't know the answer to your question. But there's a theory that has an opinion about your question. And if you wouldn't mind, let me tell you what the theory says. Look at what is, what is the opinion that the theory has. And that then might help us make a better decision faster. And I'm grateful for that opportunity I had that day in the Pentagon. And I think as, I, as you uh, pray, that our schools will improve and give us guidance about how to do that. I wanted just to offer that a common language and a good theory is actually a more powerful tool for change than almost anything else that I've found. And uh, so that's one of the things that I would like to offer to you. Um, The next theory that I'd like to offer is uh, an assertion that we made a bit ago, that the Harvard Business School and its compatriots have messed up the way people think. Um, in in uh, this, this way, in business, every time you launch a new product, in order to get the, the momentum behind a new product, you've got to be very careful in putting the case together. You study the market, you talk to people, you look at how, does, how is it distributed and made, compet and, and made, who are the competitors, can we build them, and so on. You do your very best. You then get the money that you need to launch it thinking that it will be successful. Turns out that only 20% of the all products launched in the world, uh, only 20% are successful, the other 80% fail. And the question was, I wonder if innovation is just a crapshoot. You do your best, but the best isn't good enough. And you just have to try a bunch of things, and a few will win, and most will lose, and you've got to figure out how to live with that. And that's much of what is taught at the business schools. But then more recently, the, the mantra has been, you need to just understand the customer better. Uh, because if you understand the customer, then you can decide what they need and develop a product, and you'll be successful. It turns out that that doesn't help either. And let me describe what we've decided instead about how to develop products that customers will buy. Um, almost all innovations focus on a job that people need to get done. 
So uh, as an example, here I am on the stage, Clay Christensen. Unfortunately, I just turned 65. Unfortunately, I spared my whole life at six feet eight inches tall. And so I've knocked my head off how many number of times when I go through doors. Um, I married a wonderful wife, Christine, fortunately. And we have five kids, thank goodness. Um, the fifth of our five kids, uh, Michael, unfortunately went to Stanford. <laughs> and there are all other characteristics and, and attributes about me. But my characteristics and attributes have not yet caused me to buy the New York Times today. There might be a correlation between the propensity I have to buy the Times, but they don't cause me to do that nor do our characteristics or attributes cause us to buy any products or services. But what causes us to do things is, you know, darn it, our whole lives are just filled with problems, jobs that arise in our lives needing to get done. And when we find that we have a job that needs to get done, we then get out of the house and go around and try to find something that will get the job done as well as possible. And what causes us to buy products or services is we have jobs to do. And therefore we realized that understanding the job is what's critical in being successful in innovation not the customer. The customer is the wrong unit of analysis. Um, so we uh, came upon a, pro a pro project that had been initiated by McDonald's. And McDonald's wanted to increase the sales of their milkshakes. And as you know, McDonald's is a very sophisticated company. And they had, thanks to a lot of data, build a profile of the quintessential milkshake customer. It turns out I fit the profile <laughs> too perfectly. And they would invite people like me into conference rooms and ask us, can you help us to know how to improve our milkshakes so that you'll buy more of them? And McDonald's had all the data in the world and they said, yes, we can tell you. And so we would give them the feedback, and it had no impact on sales or profits whatsoever. So um, we offered to them that, you know, we're just coming up with a new way of thinking uh, that might help you. And I said, yeah, what it essentially says is somewhere near here, there's a job that people find themselves needing to get done on occasion. And it's clear that there's a job out there that causes people on occasion to hire a milkshake to do that job. We need to understand what the job is. And so uh, we stood outside of a restaurant, I, I'm sorry, we, start, we, we went into a milkshake, into, I'm sorry. Um, we st stood in a McDonald's restaurant one evening for 18 hours. And we took very careful notes on what time did they buy the milkshake? What were they wearing? Were they alone? What, did they make other pro products with it? Did they eat it in the restaurant or did they get in the car and drove off with it? And it turned out that about 80% of the products were sold before 8.30 in the morning. It was the only thing they bought, they were always alone, and they always got in the car and drove off with it. So we came back the next year and positioned ourselves outside the restaurant so that we could confront these people as they were coming in <laughs> with their milkshake. And in language that they could understand, we'd ask them, I got problems here. What job were you trying to do that caused you to come here and hire this milkshake at 8.30 in the morning? And 
as they would struggle to answer, we'd respond by saying, well, can you think about the last time you were in the same situation, needing to get the same job done, but you didn't come here to hire a milkshake, what did you hire to get the job done? And it turned out that they all had the same job to do. That is, they had a long and boring drive to work. And one hand had to be on the wheel, but they had another hand and there wasn't anything in it. And they just needed something to do while they were driving in order to get this job done. They wanted to be engaged rather than fall asleep on this boring commute. And uh, that was the job. Um, they weren't hungry yet, but they knew they'd be hungry by 10 o'clock. So they also needed something that would just go thunk and stay there for the morning. So then we asked them, well, when you don't come here to hire a milkshake to do the job, what do you hire? And one guy said, you know, I never thought about it this way, but last Friday I hired a, a banana to do the job. Take my word for it, never hire bananas. <laughs> you can eat it in less than a, a minute. The taste is, there's no taste. Uh, and one guy said, yeah, I do, I do donuts, but I have to do it without my wife knowing because she wants me to lose weight, not gain. And uh, it gets on my fingers and that makes the, the wheel get gooey. So that doesn't do the job very well. Another guy said, yeah, I do bagels, but they're so dry and tasteless. Then I have to steer the car with my knees while I put on the cream cheese. <laughs> and then if the phone rings, I got th three problems and two hands. One guy said, I hired a Snickers bar to do the job done, but I felt so guilty. I've never hired a, a Snickers again. But let me tell you, when I come here to McDonald's and hire this milkshake, it is so viscous. It takes me 23 minutes to suck it up that thin little straw. <laughs> Who cares what the ingredients are? All I know is I'm still full at 10 o'clock. And it turned out that the milkshake does the job better than any of the competitors. And the competitors are not Burger King milkshakes as much as, as you compete against bananas and bagels and Snickers bars and coffee and, and so on. And then it turns out that the people who hired the milkshake in the afternoon hired it for a very different purpose. And that is they just wanted to talk to people that they love. And they needed us something who we could just sit down and I could look at her and she could look at me and we could just re re help them know how much we care for them. And that's a very different job to be done. And it had to be felt formulated in very different ways. It turns out that Peter Drucker was smarter than me because he said it early at first that the customer rarely buys what the company thinks that it's selling them. And understanding what the job was was very helpful because they realized that they had been improving the milkshake on dimensions of performance that were irrelevant to the job to be done. But once they understood what, the, what it was, then they could understand how they could improve it in salient dimensions uh, so that it would be successful every time. It turns out that the milkshake market is about seven times bigger than they thought it was. And the reason why is um, they had been improving the product on dimensions of performance that were irrelevant to the job. But once they realized that they were really competing against bananas and donuts and bagels and Snickers bars and coffee and so on, gosh, they were, those were duck soup because they were, none of them did the job well at all. It turns out that jobs exist everywhere. So there's a job somewhere near here, which is 
I need to get this from here to there as fast as, prof as, fast as pr possible with perfect certainty. That's a job that arises in our lives on occasion, some more than others. It turns out that Julius Caesar had this job to do on occasion. And uh, when he had the, the job to do, he could hire a horseman and a chariot to get the job done. Queen Victoria had the same job to do. But by that time, he could, she could hire a, a telegraph or a, te a railroad to get it done. Uh, Ch Churchill found on occasion that he had the same job to do. And so he could hire an hair, hair airplane to do the job, and she could hire DHL or the internet. You, turn us, you notice that the products sold in each generation were very different than the prior, but the job to be done was very stable over time. And that's a common characteristics of jobs is that on average they are very stable over time. And therefore, we don't have to try this this year and try that for next year as long as we're trying to get the job done. There are a lot of people who have jobs in education that need to get done. Students have jobs. Teachers have jobs. Parents do. Legislators do, and many more. And understanding who has what jobs to do is actually quite important because we, like McDonald's, in many times are improving our offerings on dimensions of performance that are irrelevant to the jobs that people are trying to do, especially students. We give them all of the characteristics and attributes we can think of and we back it up with new data, but we don't understand the, the fundamental jobs that they are trying to get done. So I'd like to walk you through what we think might be called a uh, architecture of a brand, or a architecture of the job to be done. In every case, Jobs arise at the bottom of the fundamental of uh, 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 architecture. The job has to be done given the situation that I'm in. Each job has a functional, an emotional, and a social dimension to the job. And the weight of those varies by the job. Once we understand that, then we have the opportunity to create the next level which is, so if that's the job, what are the experiences that we need to provide in purchase and use so that in some they will nail the job perfectly? And if we understand those experiences we need to provide, that allows us to make the next step, which is what do we need to integrate and how do we need to integrate it? so that we can provide the experiences required to nail the job perfectly. And if we do that, we can put a brand on our product that will help people find our product as soon as they realize that they had a job to do. So what I would like now to do is just go back in, uh, in this architecture and talk a, a little bit more about what I mean. Uh, I'm, what I'm trying to do is in the blue box there uh, e explode it a little bit to talk about some what we mean by experiences. We have done a lot of work with Southern New Hampshire University Online and Western Governors University Online. Uh, as you may know, together they, uh, they have about 200,000 students doing MBAs or um, masters and 
bachelor degrees, as well as uh, certificates and certifications and so on. Um, and we know them quite well. Um, one of the things that the architecture demands to them is to be able to say, what are the experiences in purchase and use? And so we distilled from that that in both cases, there are three experiences that they need to provide. And the first one is I need to learn when I'm, I need to use it when I'm learning it. And then I will use it again and again and again. I can't keep in my head things that I don't use after I've learned it. So that's an experience. I use, use it and learn it. Another experience they need to have is I need to finish this. Every student has a job to do, which is I need to be successful. And many of the students, the reason they're here at Western Governors in Southern New Hampshire is uh, on average their age is, 20, is 36 years old. They have children, 70% of them do. 70% of them want a better job. 70% of them are there because they can't buy a home. And the reason why they're there is because when they were in high school, uh, they didn't apply themselves. And so they dropped out. And the fundamental problem of that is they con concluded themselves that I can't finish this. I've tried it before, I've never done it again. And so one of the experiences they needed to provide is a coach that helps students take them through tough times. Is almost always these students are in tough times. And as I uh, understood their, their, their thinking, I said to them, uh, it's got to be costly to have a coach for each student to take them through these tough times. And the presidents of both of these universities responded, it's dirt cheap. What's costly is a student drops out. And uh, it's been very helpful to, for me to see that, how that happened. Last summer, I was asked to speak at the graduation of Western Governors at their 20th anniversary. And they had a, there was a, a very a, a wonderful story in every student's face as they came across the podium. And uh, so I wanted to just offer that, is we need to put uh, experiences uh, out there for our students to have available to them so that they will get the job done perfectly. I'll just offer this one last one. What we've studied, um, as we've, what we've learned as we've studied about innovation is that there are two for forces that work against each other. So every time I, I hire a, a new product, I can't use it until I put, put out the old one, which is how I did it before. And um, this idea that the new doesn't work unless the old changes or is gone is actually very important. Um, I was uh, at Costco a bit ago, and uh, there was somebody waiting there, waiting in the line to hire a, a mattress. And one of my colleagues uh, asked him, um, how long did it take you to buy that mattress? And they looked back and they realized that it had taken him three years to buy this mattress. Because every time he was ready to buy, 
They thought, well, we could just put it off for another year. Or I got a piece of uh, plywood and I put it under the mattress so that it wouldn't be as flimsy. Uh, and my brother-in-law, who sold us the last one, told us they have a deal on a new one. And there are just a, all kinds of things that happened which were the habits of the present and the anxiety about using a new thing to do the solution. And these things block change, block change. Um, but then on the other force, there is the push of the situation, because these new things really are exciting. And there are people pulling me into the future because the, it seems to be attractive. And I think what I, my, my conclusion of this is that many of the innovations that we attempt to achieve in higher education um, fail, not because they're intrinsically wonderful ideas, but we never have thought about what are the habits of the present and the anxieties about the future. And all of the things that we're doing we have to, in, in which we have to change our behavior. This is the reason why change is so difficult so often. And this is just another piece that we have been thinking about, about how to manage change. Um, I think I'd better stop. Um, I have just one other thing that I wanted to say to you guys. And that is, uh, a number of years ago, for reasons that I can't fully describe, I realized that God doesn't ever hire milkshakes. Uh, he doesn't hire accountants in heaven which is an idea that I'd never thought about before. But the language that got me in that direction came from a re uh, an insight that I have a finite mind. And because I have a finite mind, God, I, I, I have to be able to hire accountants because we have all of these inputs and invoices and outputs and so on. And there are so many pieces of data around me in my company or in my school. Thank goodness we have accountants and they can aggregate all of these things up and tell me we've got revenue of this going at this rate and this is, this is how much better it was than last year's and I compare this to that. And because I have a finite mind, uh, I need somebody who can make sense of the world for me by aggregating things up. And because of my finite mind, I get a sense of hierarchy in my world. If I preside over bigger companies that have bigger numbers, I feel more successful than if I preside over smaller numbers and smaller organizations. But then somehow I realized that with God, the perspective is different because God has an in infinite mind. And what that means is he doesn't need to aggregate people up into numbers in order to have a perfect understanding of what's going on in the world. Because God has an infinite mind, he doesn't need to aggregate us up as numbers in order to have a perfect understanding of what goes on. That then allowed me to say, oh my gosh, what that means is when I have my interview with him, he's not going to say, oh my gosh, Clayton Christensen, the professor, the important professor at the Harvard Business School, he's not even going to say that in my interview. Rather, what God is going to say is, Clay, can we just talk for a minute about the people that I 
put you in your path? What did you do to help them to become better people? And then if you remember, I put you in this situation. Let's just talk about the people that you helped to become better people. And then, Clay, don't remember, don't, re re don't forget that we gave you five children. Can we talk about what you did to help those five people become magnificent children? And I realized that when God will measure my life, there will be no numbers over which I presided. But rather, God is going to ask me the individual people that I help to become better people. And I just can't imagine, as I, have, as I come to the end of my life, I realized that now I know how God will measure my life. And uh, I hope that I can say that every day I did all that I could to help people in my path to become better people. And I just wanted to close by thanking you guys. I think that you have chosen a truly noble profession. And I know that as God assesses how you've done, it adds up in his mind, not in numbers, but as individual people in his mind that are important to him. And I, I thank you for the noble profession that you have chosen. Thank you, and God bless you.